Dang it, Bobby. Oklahoma City, the city of opportunity for all producers and musicians, music producers and beat makers. We are the foundation of all music. I interviewed some of the greatest producers in Oklahoma and young greats in the making. Episode one. City. So I'm from Oklahoma City, if you ain't know. Um, I grew up in Choctaw. Um, I'm from Oklahoma City. Um, I'm actually based in Midwest City, like the Spencer area, kind of. Oh, I'm from the south side of Oklahoma City, to be exact. Current Village, southwest side. Oklahoma City, 405. Sooner born, sooner bred. I am from Blanchard, Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma City, yo. Oklahoma City, man. Dead City, Oklahoma, born and raised. Born in Oklahoma City, raised in Midwest City. Man, I'm from the west side of Oklahoma City, man. I was anti-social as fuck, bro, in school. So like shit, all I did was stay on the computer and listen to music. See, bro, I just downloaded uh, a program called Mixcraft. I got the cooking up, bro. I've been doing like like studio engineering and producing for, for like metal bands and stuff like that for a while in like my early 20s and then i used to be in the army and i was gonna i went to iraq and before i went because uh, i knew i was gonna have you know some downtime and i was just gonna be stuck in a little desert so i was like i'm gonna teach myself how to make beats and I got like Reason and I had like a little Dell computer and uh, I just, yeah, just kind of started using myself out of any beats when I went over there. But I started doing music with poetry really. So starting with poetry, I kind of really, I wanted to be a singer, but y'all, I can't really sing like that. <laughs> like I can, but I can't. But doing poetry, I kind of got into rap a little bit more. And that's when I could, I really, really started to fall in love with that. So yeah, that's kind of the start of it all. And then I um, ended up, you know, we got our group together, Dynasty Cash, shout out Victoria. We pulled that together and then Nightmare Gang came in the picture. Shout out Lex, shout out Quincy, shout out Trey. And from there, we just, we here. I started out wanting to be a film director, like that's what everybody don't know. But like doing that and making my little like home movies at home and stuff and writing scripts, I would, um, I basically, I needed music for my films because I, I did it, I edited it, I shot it, wrote it and everything. So I was like, oh, I need music now. So I was like, okay, let me download some software and do this. And I, I think I downloaded Mixcraft or something. Yeah. That was one of the first things I ever used too. Mixcraft. Like, I started making my early like music in that, but it was real cinematic and film score. It wasn't necessarily like hip hop or anything. Like it didn't have drums a lot of time. It was like strings and pianos. And I think maybe starting out that way, that's why I'm so good at melodies now. It's cause like- It was really cool for me, but now that I'm older, it's become the brunt of a joke. I went to band camp in seventh grade <laughs> and I took, the way band camp goes is you take classes, you get to pick your schedule. And I did a mixing class and I remixed Daft Punk. And yeah, I was like 12. It was really bad. And I have it on like a burned CD, so <laughs> it's really rough. <laughs> the love of music, bro. My family, all my family has been involved with music my whole life. My mom, my dad sing, my uncles play instruments, you know. But they, they play Mexican music. Uh, I say some uh, some close family members. I was saying before, like a mainstream person that was with family members, you know what I'm saying, they fuck with me. My dad showed me how to create beats. I used to bug him all the time. Hey, yo, dad, I, I, wanna, I wanna make a beat. And he'll, he'll go in there, you know, I'll tell him the melody, he'll do the melodies on the beats and stuff like that. 
as I got older, he was like, you know what, son? Uh, you know what you're doing, but let me sit you down and show you how to quantize and put the tracks together. And that's kind of how um, I started making beats at like 13, 14 years old. So yeah. The death of our brother Goofy. Uh, mine was like, started making music when I was young, but like really pushed it to start making, making music with my brother Jacoby. Man, I was rapping. I was just a rapper at first, and I could never really find beats I liked on the internet. So I was like, you know what? I'm just learn how to make my own. I started DJing shit when I was 15. So I went to UCO, and I was just there, you know what I'm saying? Doing regular shit, DJing and shit. And I ran into them, and they were like making music, and I was like, damn, I fuck with them, you know what I'm saying? And they were telling me they needed a DJ, so I was like, shit. I'll be all DJ, I'll fuck with y'all, you know, the whole double O group and shit. Yeah. And um, so shit, really, I just seen how they was making music, bro, and I was inspired, bro. I'm like, man, I, I can make music for sure. So I kind of jumped into that shit. I was recording at first, though. I wasn't even producing at first. I was recording for a whole year, just being an engineer and mixing the songs and shit. And then after that, I kind of like got into making beats after that. FL, from start to finish. <laughs> Ooh, man, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little older guy, so, you know, we didn't really, yeah, we didn't really have the, we didn't really have the software then, man. I kind of, I look back then, I'm like, woo, you know, uh, we was using hardware. Uh, my dad had this old school keyboard called the Insonic. It was a big, heavy keyboard. I mean, it was heavy, but it was the Insonic. Um, and um, we had floppy disks. That's how old school it is. Uh, we actually have floppy disks that you put into the keyboard with the other sounds that you had and stuff. Hilarious now, I think about it. Save your beats and stuff on the floppy disk. <laughs> uh, but that's what I started using first. From that, I was synthesizers um, long before um, workstations where we could loop properly. I mean, we literally had to spice stuff. So like, you would you would have a, a two track and you'd have to bounce it from one to the other, bounce it from one to the other, and then just do it all in real time. It sucked. But it was cool, because like I said, it, it taught you grassroots. When you learn it that way, not only can you appreciate what it is you're doing, but like anything you can do on top of that to kind of improve what sound you started out with, it's like day and night, you know, with how much you can appreciate the sound and how you can kind of build from that and grow from that. I think for like maybe a couple months I did GarageBand, but then I kind of expanded out and then I started using Fruit Loops. And then for the last 11 years now, I've just been mainly Fruit Loops. Pull up FL Studio right now, it's the normal person. They look at it like it's alien technology, man. And um, as long as you're willing to put in the work, you, you will see some of the craziest things. I personally view like FL Studio is like the production version of uh, Pro Tools. You know what I mean? And so it's because there's so much, there's so much stupid things that you can do in this thing in FL Studios, but as long as you know how to do it, it really becomes like a, just a huge creative process. And I think uh, FL Studio has expanded my way of just being creative, you know? Especially moving from like, you know, I use Logic Pro Tools to record and engineer. You know, I don't use any of that stuff to make beats because the creativity process and what is available to you in FL Studios is expansive, you know, as long as you are willing to know how to use it. I love making beats on Acid. Acid was my favorite. It's just super easy to use for me. It's easy to write easy to quantize, everything. And it didn't matter whether I was making the beats in Acid or in Sonar, I could make them in either one. I, I enjoyed making beats in Acid more than I did Sonar, and I loved recording in Sonar. Oh uh, man, I'm honestly, man, I'm a melody guy. Um, I can listen to a melody, a beautiful melody without the drums, to be real with you like symphonies, violins, pianos, 
Um, those are like really my favorite harps. Those are like some of my favorite sounds. It's just a beautiful tune to it. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up on R&B, you know what I mean? I grew up on the R&B stage. Uh, my family was bumping R&B in the household. Once again, my older brother who's in R&B always had the Jagged Edge and the Jodeces and the 112s and stuff like that. So, um, Silk, you know, all those major dope groups back in the day, Drew Hill was always in our in our system. So I grew up on the melodies instead of more the drums, because you know, R&B doesn't really, didn't have those hard 808s and they do it and now. So, you know, as times change, but um, those early 90s, mid 90s and late 90s, it was more um, just dope melody, piano play and, and uh, you know, you know what I mean? What too much? What too much going on? You didn't have to, do, 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 you know what I mean? All the crazy drops and stuff now. So it's definitely more just a just a cool little kick, simple symbol, little snare or clap or whatever, and, and, and beautiful melodies. So that's I'm a melody guy all day for sure. I start off my beats with melodies to this day. So yeah, <laughs> got man, got to have that melody. Once you get that major melody, the rest is history. You know what I'm saying? Everything else is easy. The melody is like essential, bro. But the drums, I feel like once you lay that 808 or that bass on there, that doom or that boom, 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 that 808, like that spins 808 or that Zaytoven 808, I feel like once the drums complete, nigga, that's the best beat, you know what I'm saying? The beats, you know what I'm saying? It's complete by then. Uh, I'm gonna start out with like a melody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much all the time. And I'll just normally start out with a melody. And then I might add another counter melody on top of that. And then I'll start adding hi-hats and drum stuff. And I usually add the bass in last, like the, the bass for the 808. I usually add that in the very last. So when it comes to building songs and making them in the studio, like live, um, my favorite part is probably mixing because that's when you start to see things actually come alive. Um, the initial create, uh, I don't know, making beats is really fun too. I'm just not as good at it, <laughs> so it's not as fun. Um, but mixing, you know, you can take something that's already naturally super beautiful and just create this, uh, just, it's an innovative process and I really, really, really like it. Really when I make music, the way that my brain works is I kind of just listen to a beat and I'm pretty quick about knowing if a beat is gonna be something, like if it has that potential. And as soon as I know that, instantly words start coming to my head. Like, it's almost just instinctual. So it could be a chorus, it could be a verse, it might even just be one line. It's actually a feeling for me. Um, long time ago, somebody taught me that um, there's certain notes you can hit that will bring certain emotions. Um, when I think I heard that, it was like, uh -huh. like light bulb went off. Yeah, you know, like you thought to yourself, if there's any truth to that, there's so many. I mean, it's only eight notes on the keyboard, right? So you, you're bound to find that chord at some point or another. Man, it's got to be the drums. Like, I feel like the drums are the soul of the song. You know, it doesn't matter what genre it is, alternative to hip hop, to EDM, even to something more open like soul and R&B. You know, the way the drum sets that rhythmic tone, the way the drums like either just smacks or it just lays low and lets things breathe, it really kind of just brings everything up, makes everything sound more alive. A lot of drums. The drums set the beat off. You know what I'm saying? That's what that's what creates the rhythm. It's, it's just something about making drums, and creating that bounce. You know what I'm saying? It just sets it off. I mean, that note from the west side, like till to like my name used to be. Fifth grade, Dice 22, bro. My first rap name on God, bro. In middle school, I, I kept with the rap. In high school, I always rap, but shit, it just seemed, it came to a point 
why I rap. Then I start producing or I produce and I start rapping. But now I'm on the point to where I'm now just like doing both. You know what I'm saying? 2000, 2001, I was doing freestyle rapping, right? Well, I had been freestyle rapping all through the late 90s, 97, 96, 97, all the way up to the to the 2000s, you know, I was freestyling because the Houston vibe, drink a syrup, motherfuckers was just freestyle kings all day, you know? And then um, I started going to this, this thing called the Samurai Saki House. They used to be on Northwest, on, on Northwestern, right in over there, almost by Nickel Hills, kind of close to there. Uh, it's a Baskin Robbins now, so. But anyways, we used to go to this spot and used to do showcases, like MC battle showcases, freestyle battle showcases. And uh, shout out to the guys, man. Uh, my man Shock B, my man PJ, you know what I'm saying, who's actually the, the masterminds behind the whole, you know, Wednesday night freestyle, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Freaking, I got introduced to some cats, some young dudes who was doing a lot of freestyle stuff. Uh, I was a rapper, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, me and my cousin, Vicious, we went by the name of Rugged Individuals with a Z. You gotta have the Z in it. Um, it's something fun that we did, you know what I mean? It was nothing really just um, serious that we was like, oh, we're gonna blow up, we're gonna be huge and famous. It was never like that, it was just something that we did and then just enjoy just coming together as cousins and just enjoy doing. Um, I, we, we grew up watching our dads make music, you know what I mean? Our dads to this day still make music and the band and stuff. So when we was growing up, our dads is playing the keyboards, the guitars. Uh, my older brother, Trey, Trey McCoy from the group Meant To Be, um, you know, watching him elevate and do his thing. So it was always around me growing up, but um, it, it just got, it got serious more later on in life. So yeah, for sure. You know, guys that was doing DJing, my man Nemesis, my man Duo, Keys, JB, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Obi-Wan, AKA Burn, Group Fly, you know what I mean? Started meeting all these guys, Disciple. Uh, bro, fucking Super Dave, Katine. Bro, it was just a whole bunch of them. And we was doing freestyle battles, you know? And that's how we started doing like line battles and then it started getting kind of just you know we started going out of town with it and literally i think three four months us doing this stuff right uh we go do uh oklahoma city versus dallas battle in texas at this place called the wildcat wild coconut no no it's the wild coconut no not the wild what was it it's the Caribbean Grill in Dallas, Texas. All right, so we out there, and you know, it's my first time touching, you know, a, a, like an out of town stage like that as a fucking rapper, or as whatever the fuck I was, you know. So yeah, I was rapping. I was rapping for a while, and uh, I teamed up with a group of guys, like when in my beginning process of making beats. Uh, it was a team called Flight Club that I used to get beats from on SoundClick. They're from Kansas City. Shout out to my guy DJ Tank, JK, and John. Um, yeah, like I, I told them I was making beats and they let me join the team. And after that, man, you know, I was putting my beats on their page as well. And, you know, they would get ranked on SoundClick. I would be passing people like Johnny Giuliano, Epic, Vibe, you know what I'm saying? Just fighting for those spots on the charts, you know what I'm saying? Man. Yeah, that's really what it was. Definitely writing first. The the beat making thing kind of came with it. I mean, you know, I came from an era where in school, we won tabletops on the desk, bro. Like, I mean, we were real heavy with the thumbs and the, and the, and the pencils, you know what I'm saying? We get in there and, and make beats like that. Uh, when beatboxing and stuff came along, we were all, all over that. Um, the stomping, you know what I mean? Like, uh, We Will Rocky from uh, Kiss and all that, or whatever it was. Queen, rather, and <clears throat> Kiss. Um, that uh, that was like, those like anthems, you know what I'm saying? So like, when you could get a rhythm 
off of just organic stuff like stomping like thumbs and pencils and all of that that was that was kind of how you kind of went at it and then um since i was already writing and stuff um beats just kind of came naturally uh i took to to sampling before i took to actually making like original beats early on um run dmc and fat boys beastie boys is one of my biggest influences about cool j all of that stuff um really is what kind of i took a, a liking to early on i, w- I would say i mean i really I can just pick up and leave and go do tours on a whim and I can negotiate deals for the artists. I can I can do a lot of things. Being a commodity, learning how to do things besides what you do. You know what I'm saying? Like, so if you're an artist, learn how to engineer, record people, do things. Like if you're a producer, learn how to be a videographer, learning how to play instruments, you know what I'm saying? Being Playing piano, you know what I'm saying? Like for instance, like that's, being a, I always stress about being a commodity. That's what takes you to the top and gets you in the door. During my time at Berkeley and at ACM, I networked um, a lot. And in law school, I networked a lot. Um, so I think that my asset is the amount of people that I know and my ability to get to know people. Um, and being the same person in all those rooms. I think that's really important. That's <laughs> uh, how you carry yourself. I, I think that may, it makes me valuable to know people in New York, LA, Vegas, Miami. I can set you up wherever you need to go. Um, but you know what? As I got older, I was like, you know, this is something I might need to pursue more. Um, but then I said, I need to be a better engineer. You know what I mean? I need to be a better, uh, um, you know, audio engineer. Then I became a sound engineer. And then I wanted to get deeper into the graphics. And then I want to become uh, a tour manager or do work on tours and stuff like that. So I just always elevated my my, 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 my frame of being just a producer. You know what I mean? And I think that asset right there was made me um, valuable for anything in this music industry. You know what I mean? If you need me for mixing, I could do it. If you need me for engineering, I could do it. If you need me for producing, Got you. You need me for graphics. I got you. You need me to do sound engineer. I got you. You know what I mean? You 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 ain't gonna turn me away for everything. You are gonna need me for something. And um, I give up my all on everything I do. So I think that's something really was was dope about myself, man. I, I learned the game in every aspect. I can even do management. I can even do A and R shit. You know what I'm saying? So if you really want to be an asset to someone, just don't try to be like someone else. You know, like let's say you're getting a let's say someone tries to offer you a deal. Um, don't change your sound to try to like be mainstream or try to sound like someone else. You know, they want Bobby for Bobby, they don't want Bobby for Drake. You know what I mean? And so if you really want to be an asset, just focus on trying to increase your own value to how you can try to be more to society. You just got to have that whole 9,000 miles in this industry. Cause like I said, you it's, it's a here today, gone tomorrow, man. And there's always somebody trying to take your spot, not necessarily take your spot, but who will take your spot if you're not, you know, uh, still flourishing in this industry, for sure. Make an impact. Like, people are trying to see the consistency, the work ethic. They're trying to, that these days it's not about just sitting around and letting a motherfucker work you. It's like, they want to see you work. They want to see what you got, what you can do yourself. They want you to get out here they want to see if you can really get out here by yourself and do it by yourself. If you And if you can, here, let us give you a little extra to help you off the situation. That's the best you got to make sure you're getting paid, bro. Y'all can't be showing up to these shows, these sketchy venues, and these bars and these clubs, bro, and it's like five, ten people there, bro, and it's no security at the door, bro. Like, you wearing this gold and jewelry around your neck, niggas going to try you, bro, you know what I'm saying? So. I was just say, make sure, bro, you got you, you got your money, bro. That make, make sure you protect it. You know what I'm saying? They know. Mm-hmm. If you have something that people want or you can do something for people, then uh, you're going to attract people that want those things from you, man. And you're going to be asset to them. And that helps a lot of people out. And in order to be an asset, the best way to always do it is to do just that. What needs to be done I'm doing it. If I need some help, I'm getting those resources together and I'm pulling all of that together 
and making it work. Yeah, no, you're an asset to people as long as they they think that you can benefit them, you know what I mean? And the funny thing is, is I learned this once I kind of got out of the scene for a little bit, is that uh, they'll put up with a lot of shit. If somebody really thinks that you can do something for them, they'll, they'll put up with a lot of bullshit. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's the truth. But that's that's what being an asset is. It's just doing things that need to be done and you don't have to be asked to do it. You feel me? That's what I try to do is like help you get off, check off that checklist of technical things. And like I can handle all that for you at one person in very fast succession, like studio, video, DJ, in club, you know what I'm saying? Cover art, release it. I can do all that real fast for you. So it's like People just fuck with you because you you, bro. You know what I'm saying? And that's all you gotta be. You gotta be productive and you gotta be tolerable. Simple. Nothing more than that. It's just like any work field, you know what I'm saying? You have to be productive at work and you have to be tolerable by your coworkers. Simple. You just stay in your lane and be good at what you do. Simple. That's how you be a asset and not a liability. It ain't even really about the money, but it is, bro. Like, even though I got passion for music, bro, I got like, my mama, she, she, she still stay in the dub, bro. Like, nigga, you know what I'm saying? My day, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get like all my people, you know, all my folks, you know what I'm saying, a better position. Like, you know what I'm saying? All the homies and shit, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to bring a whole lot of people with me. So shit, it's more, more about the success than the money part, but you know what I'm saying? Money come with it. Achievement is just being able to show people that Oklahoma has the same talent as any other place. That's really it. Yeah, I'd like to open up a door for other artists to make it out. I don't uh, necessarily think that it has to be one artist, but I think as a collective, Oklahoma's got a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I would love, you know, I think every, or maybe not every artist, but a lot of artists, you know, they want the Grammys. They want the, the BET Awards, the MTV Awards, all of that. And that's definitely, you know, something, of course, that I would like to garner within my career. But, um... Yeah, win an award, hell. You know what I'm saying? For me, win an award, and it's, it's over with from there. You know what I'm saying? Truthfully, I really just want to inspire people. I want to give people that motivation. You know, coming from Oklahoma, it's not very easy doing this. So if I can do it as a female in Oklahoma, anybody can do this. Like chase your dreams. Like there's nothing stopping you but yourself. So as long as I get that, as long as I inspire, as long as I, you know, have that core fan base that really, really vibes with me and understands that and we, we're here with it, that's all I want, really. We grind it up, okay? I'm not gonna say I'm gonna get there, but you know what I'm saying, I'm gonna push to get there. But then I speak that shit to exist, so nigga do want that grand. Nigga do want an award, you know what I'm saying? BT fuck with me. And we just keep grinding, you know what I mean? Like yeah, shit like that. It's, this is 20 years in the game. You know what I'm saying? Like that was probably a question I could have answered 10 years ago. A lot of the Artists that I grew up inspired by, I done did shows with them or are like friends with. You see what I'm saying? Or are actually, you know, real, real familiar with who I am. So it's kind of like a lot of the stuff that I've done already is, I've done a lot, bro. It's crazy. I'm just blessed to be here at this age. You know? One, four, I don't know. So for, for me, what success is, is first of all, not, not leaving. The goal in the beginning was to stick by Oklahoma and try to make something happen here. I don't know. I don't, I don't really want a Grammy or nothing like that. Like Grammys are cool, but I don't know, it's like a lot of politics and like weird shit in there. So I'm not really. Maybe 
I guess, man. But I, you know, I think I think what would really be tight would really just to be able to fucking uh, just travel the world and just play music. You know, like DJing and stuff. That's a great question. So, with me right now, I don't give a crap. Uh, <laughs> everything I wanted to do in the music, no, I didn't get to do everything. But for those things that I did get to do, I am forever grateful. Ever, ever grateful, bro, because there were so many talented individuals that I got to meet along this journey, and it has been nothing shy of incredible. I guess what I'm trying to say is like all the little plaques and stuff and all that, that's cool to like have, to like show people, hey, I've done this or whatever. But uh, like, I had stuff like that. And what's weird is, is I kind of got rid of a lot of that stuff. When I, I kind of lost my mind for a minute. I got rid of a lot of that stuff. And so like, I don't know, I guess it just doesn't really, that, I don't know. I didn't answer your question at all. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it'd just be cool to travel the world. Really, I don't. I don't really care about like numbers and all that stuff because I think all that shit's fake now, anyways. Honestly. Can you buy beer and drink? Yeah, it's just I'd rather just be out doing stuff and just be in a, just be like a thing on the internet that people look at. Helping other producers, helping other producers grow and do what I did and even better. You know what I'm saying? That's what I think. Coming from where we come from in Oklahoma, there is no set culture on music. You feel me? Like how there's a certain particular sound in Atlanta and Houston, and I feel like we don't we don't have that here. We don't have anything people claim yet. You know what I'm saying? And I want to help pioneer that. I want to be a part of that sound. When you say when you hear Oklahoma sound, you think. Rob Stovall and the people that he's helped, you know, bring up. You can't put a price tag on nothing like that, bro. Like, it's cool to, to go and cop a nice whip or, you know, send somebody your first $2 million check, whatever. I think all of that would be great. I'm not hating on that at all. The moments can't be bought, bro. <laughs> There's no price tag for it. You get a chance to sit down with something special. I'm like being in the studio with the legend. Man, embrace that, bro. I promise you, man. It ain't nothing like that in the world. You can't go buy it, bro. I'm telling you, you can't. It ain't for sale. It ain't being broadcast. It ain't being advertised. This ain't the stuff people talk about right here. This right here. This ain't what, what they talk about. Yeah. Um, shit, what was it? We was at the celebrity basketball game at PC North. Shit, fucked around, got on the floor. But yeah, um, nah, bro, I got, I don't, I, mean, I, I walked past security, bro. Shit, and you know what I'm saying, me, I got anxiety, but at the same time, when it's time to handle business, like, shit, it's time to handle business, so. I just go to a nigga, approach a nigga, you know what I'm saying, we all human, bro. So, you know what I'm saying, I just walk up, uh, bro, really? Um, sometimes Rob will hit me up when a big artist comes down here and like send loops for that person. You know, I, I can't really remember it, but I don't know if anything's actually came out of that, but I've had those type of calls. You see, when I looked on Instagram, I said, damn, cowboy up in this hole. So I think, I, I think we, I linked in with that nigga. He said, yeah, shoot me, shoot, shoot me your number, gang. Ever since then, niggas been locking in, bro, you know what I'm saying? You just gotta chop it up with niggas. Be like, you know what I'm saying? Be yourself. Don't try to be like, no. Yeah. I think the easiest way, if you're wanting to get in touch with bigger artists, for me, the easiest way is to have something to show, first and foremost. Just because I think, okay, if you were gonna go and talk to, you know, um, somebody about buying a house, right? They want to see the proof that you make enough money to do that. They want to make sure that they're not wasting their time. They want to make sure you can even afford to see the house that you're trying to even see, let alone buy it. And I think it's kind of the same way in the industry. You have to put in that work. You have to show them, yes, I'm investing in myself. I am not getting those. But what I am doing is, you know, building relationships with people like Kutta who are getting those sort of messages and, you know, 
getting to be in the room that he's created. So um, for years, um, Kata has taken me under his wing and allowed me to network and meet all the people that he brings in here. You can take those things and then talk to bigger artists. It makes a lot of a difference rather than, you know, just saying, oh, I got some shit on the way or, you know, whatever. And in turn, it'll, it'll also have them reach out to you without you even having to do anything because if they see you on your grind, they're going to want to, you know, be a part of it or they're at least going to want to know who you are and, you know, have that good relationship with you. So I feel like every environment calls for different, you know what I'm saying? That meaning for sure. But like in the studio, if you're in the studio with people, like you really just got to sit back and be chill in the cut, you know what I'm saying? And then whenever it's your opportunity for you to kind of flash your personality and flash your music ability or whatever, then that's when you go ahead and take it, you know what I'm saying? Like you're not the rapper, I'll just be chilling in the studio. When niggas ask me about beats, who got some beats or who makes beats, man, I need some beats. That's when I'll step up to the plate, you know what I'm saying? I got something, what's up? Oh, you know what I'm saying? Then cool, I'll play some beats while we playing beats. I might, you know, crack a joke or something, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just, I'll be trying to fill up, fill the room out just to see how I can drip in the room, you know what I'm saying? So after I kind of fill it out, then I kind of can like move around the room, maneuver how I feel, you know what I'm saying? And make it happen for myself. Ultimately, it's up to you to keep those relationships and be, um, you know, inviting and conversational and all those things and be knowledgeable enough to want to be invited back into the room. Um, because the only thing JB and Kata can get me is an introduction. Opportunity. Right. The rest of it is, is definitely on whoever they introduce. Um, I think it's easier for me nowadays, now that I'm, you know, signed and whatnot. But uh, coming up, it was really just going outside, you know? No, I wasn't really focused on hitting people up on the internet. I was worried about getting in their faces and then getting that chance to press play for them. So like, I think that's really what it was. Going to festivals and just catching people outside, you know what I'm saying? Catching people at vulnerable points. That way I can get a chance to, you know, do what I do. Yeah. It's a little bit of both, you know, like everyone kind of starts off somewhere, you know, everyone's a newbie, everyone's just, everyone starts off from the ground up. And so you have to really take the time to experiment and fail uh, consistently, to continually grow as an individual to kind of reach out and say, you know, how am I going to reach out to new people? Because until you get to a certain point where they reach out to you, you're going to be doing a lot of the reaching out. You know, whether that's through social media, whether that's through in person, going to events, uh, showing up at live concerts, finding a backstage pass, talking to the managers, talking to the DJs. There's a hundred ways you can do it. Uh, but most of the time, bro, you're going to have to put in the work yourself. But whenever you actually start, um, really putting in the work kind of like what we talked about before whenever things start becoming an addiction whenever you're doing music as an addiction you start to realize it pays off long term i didn't have some folks hit me up but like me i hit up uh you know i, I had my team hit their team you know what i'm saying and that's just how we gonna get it from there like you know what i'm saying it's probably be me but it might be my team don't reach out to you though so my team reach out and we live Shows, events, DMs. Uh, if I always see them in public, I always try to catch Instagram or a phone number. Uh, if it's over networking in it in the internet, I try to work with them as soon as possible to see you know what they're about and you know try to get a feel from them because it's hard to do it over to the internet. I like feeling the person out whenever I work with them because I don't know your ethics. One word, articulation. You gotta learn how to talk. Okay? Every word don't have to be a cuss word. Every word that you say don't have to be a derogatory, direct, you know, shots fired type like statement. Talking about people. You don't have to do all that. It's not necessary. Like, people are people. And because they are, you'll find that most of the time, people are more receptive to having a meaningful conversation. No, this is their approach. When they're trying to sell you something. Let's say they got merch. Let's say they got CDs. Let's say they got t-shirts, right? What is what is the pitch that they're gonna come to me with? Hey, bro, hey, yo. What can I do with that? I 
got them. Oh, you know, I got them. I got them. Okay. I'm not interested. And I got to leave it at that because they don't even know how to approach me. They don't know how to talk. They don't even try. So that's the part I, do, I disagree with. Like, you got to you gotta articulate your words. Expand your vocabulary. Learn how to talk, bro. Like, to me, that's all you need. Um, the demographics game is so... I mean, just this is just vast.